Western Massachusetts lost a lot of political clout on Beacon Hill with the retirements last year of John Syback, Steve Kulik, and the death of Peter Kokut. House Speaker Robert DeLeo has announced legislative committee appointments, and some Western Mass legislators have been appointed to key committees. I sat down with three of them recently, Aaron Vega, Jose Tosado, and Michael Finn, to talk about their work and what it will mean for Western Massachusetts. I have been, I've had the privilege to have been uh, appointed vice chairman of the Committee on Mental Health, Substance Use and Recovery. Uh, I've also been uh, reappointed to the Committee on Financial Services, uh, which one of my colleagues chairs. Uh, and I'm also on the Committee on Housing, which is going to be a huge issue moving forward in, in this season. My background is I have a master's degree in clinical social work. Uh, for 28 years, I was the director of the State Department of Mental Health for the Greater Springfield area. Uh, so I come with a lot of experience in, relative to, to mental health and, and, and substance uh, use disorders. Actually, uh, Governor Baker has made mental health funding uh, one of his top uh, priorities as well as, uh, as, as funding for, for substance use. Uh, my, uh, one of my largest priorities relative well to mental health is creating more treatment opportunities for children and adolescents. Uh, I think that, uh, that there's an issue there in terms of the, the, the lack of sufficient uh, treatment beds for that population. So again, I'm, I'm hoping to, to be able to review a, a number of bills that, that are that'll be before the committee that address uh, these very issues. Yes, some very important issues, obviously. Representative Vega as well, uh, the committee or committees you're on now and, and your priorities as you move forward with the uh, bills on those committees. Thanks, Ryan. Great to see you and great to be with my friends and colleagues here. Uh, so I'm, I'm reappointed to higher ed again, and that's critically important to Western Mass, obviously with Holy Community College, STC, um, the UMass, so it's a really great committee. Uh, I'm reappointed on uh, the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, sorry, the Cannabis Committee. Uh, so our committee, along with the Cannabis Control Commission, are basically regulating a brand new industry, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and then my new appointments this session actually are on exports, uh, which is a whole new conversation to think about how Massachusetts companies and their relationships outside of our borders and internationally. So that's been uh, interesting to learn about. And then I'm um, vice chair with our good friend Angela Pupolo, who's the chair of uh, Intergovernment Affairs and uh, Technology. And a lot of that focuses on cybersecurity, which we know is critical nowadays. And we'll be you know, meeting with Bay State and uh, about their cybersecurity, keep our medical records safe. We'll be meeting with ISO New England to talk about the energy grid and how we keep that safe. So uh, again, very timely uh, and also kind of expanding sort of the purview. Obviously, we're always focused on district and, and Western Mass, but to start to see the bigger picture um, and how Massachusetts plays a role internationally and nationally, uh, should be really exciting. And Representative Michael Finn, you are chair of a very important committee and, now as yes. you move move forward in that capacity. Tell us about uh, the committee you're chair of now and, and what's going on with that. So uh, very, I was very excited when I got the call from the speaker uh, notifying me that I was going to be the chairman of the committee. Um, I think it's, it's uh, oftentimes lost on folks you know where we are as a commonwealth when it comes to global warming and climate change issues you know the commonwealth was a leader nationally when we passed the global warming solutions act and the regional greenhouse gas initiative and we set some you know uh, short-term and long-term uh, goals for achieving um, renewable energies and the use of those in, as a commonwealth and so you know the early research that we've done in the committee is, to, you know, we know that we're about to hit the 2020 goals for renewable energies here in the Commonwealth. But then, you know, what's that next step? Because the next uh, level in in that pursuit is 2050 goals. And so there's no intermediate goals in the between the 2020 and 2050. There's no intermediate goals. So, you know, how do you judge whether we're achieving what was set forth in that initial legislation? So that's part of the challenge uh, in that committee right now. And then one of the other things that has come to light as I've been, you know, going out across the state and meeting with you know, the folks at UMass Amherst and their climatology department and UMass Lowell and UMass Boston and, and um, uh, Harvard, uh, not Harvard, I'm sorry, MIT, they all have these huge programs that address this particular issue. And one of the glaring, I guess, shortfalls that the Commonwealth has right now is a, a, uh, the lack of a state climatologist or risk assessment area. And so while we have different pockets of academia and government that are working, there's no real central uh, point of contact in the state. And so I think that you know, as we move forward, we'll try to, you know, get at that a little bit deeper. You obviously have had to do a lot of research, a lot of homework since you took over yes. the chairmanship. Is there something about the uh, the climate change issue that 
you weren't aware of before, anything you learned uh, in your research now in, in, uh, on the committee? I, I would say that there, there's two specific areas. Number one uh, is that, you know, Massachusetts, uh, there's, there's some scientific data that will support this, but Massachusetts is really uh, at an epicenter of global warming impacts. So in the western part of the state, we're experiencing higher levels of carbon dioxide. We have uh, probably, uh, not probably, we definitely have some of the worst air quality across the state and across New England. And so Western Massachusetts has a significant set of challenges. And then uh, from a sea level rise, if you're looking at the melting of the polar caps and some other areas, Boston seems to be right on this, on this rim of um, where it's, the academics would tell you that you know Boston is slowly sinking while sea levels are slowly rising, and that's going to be a real problem. And so, from a planning perspective, you know the city of Boston has a whole department that's dedicated towards how are we going to mitigate the impacts of sea level rise. You know, uh, up and down the Massachusetts coastline is a significant. Um, you know, other area of concern because the economic impacts, you know, like let's say if, for instance, uh, an inlet should change its location and situate, you know, like if something like that were to occur, what happens to all the property owners along there? What happens to the towns, transportation infrastructure? I mean, it's, it's, it's a significant problem uh, that is going to require, and if you, and I should say, if you look globally, uh, not, I mean, not just in the state of Massachusetts, across the country and across the world, you know, people are starting to really recognize and acknowledge the science and that things need to be done. And so I think Massachusetts is, based on our reputation of being the first in a lot of different things, I think what we'll, you'll start seeing a lot more activity in this realm. Mm -hmm. Representative Vega, you mentioned one of the committees you're on is marijuana policy. Mm -hmm. And the state, of course, is implementing this uh, new policy with regard to marijuana sales now that it's legalized in Massachusetts. Um, how do you feel the implementation of the new mar marijuana law has gone uh, with regard to retail sales now? A lot of people have complained that it's taken forever to get this up and running. But uh, overall, how do you think things are moving? I think overall things are moving well. I think this, the, the legislation that we passed last session and then the implementation by the CCC is going smooth. It's going slow, uh, but I think, you know, and as much as Massachusetts prides itself on being first, we're also a very pragmatic state. Uh, and we like to make sure that we do things in the right way. Um, and I think that now that we've seen things aren't, the sky's not going to fall, now that this is open, now that people are buying it legally, um, and now we start to see the revenue that's coming in. You know, Northampton just posted over $700,000 to revenue to their budget, uh, just from the 3%, uh, the 2 3% taxes that they get. Um, so I think overall it's gone, going well. What I'm worried about, what we need to address, I think specifically this session, is what we put into legislation and what the CCC is trying to do around equity and making sure that minorities get access to opening businesses, that, that it's going to be owned by small businesses and local people. I think we're already seeing, you know, quote unquote, big cannabis, as we say, coming into Massachusetts already. We just saw Netta being sold to, an, to, a, national, to a national company. So how do we maintain, um, you know, a very expensive business to get into? Uh, how do we make sure that there's pathways for local people, especially minority-owned and women-owned businesses, to establish themselves in this industry as well? And that's, gonna, that's where I think the rubber meets the road. So are there going to be tweaks in the, the regulations now as they stand? I think there'll be some tweaks in regulations, probably, probably tweaks on regulations around that, but I think more of the regulation tweaks are going to be um, you know, working with the CCC and how they want to maybe pilot on-site consumption, you know, down the road. We've other, also seen other states on, on starting to do, you know, delivering different things. So I think there's going to be looks at that. I know a lot of that was sort of stopped uh, and paused, which makes sense. But now I think we're ready to sort of look at the next aspects of it. And then I think when it comes to regulation, it's also going to be about support. What are those, when we think about other small businesses in Massachusetts, we have a lot of supports out there for them to get started, whether it's technical training, technical assistance, or loan programs. Should we be mirroring that? Uh, in the cannabis industry, especially when we talk about locally owned, minority owned, and women owned businesses? Should there be that kind of support for, as well? Representative Sauter, you touched on an important point in your introductory remarks. That is with regard to uh, substance use, uh, mental health, uh, with regard to beds for recovery. Uh, is there money in the budget uh, that's being proposed that would specifically address the needs out here in western Massachusetts where we need uh, more treatment facilities? Uh, there's absolutely uh, money in the budget that, that's going to flow to western Massachusetts. It's, a, it's just a, they're statewide services, so the money gets spread across the state. 
in Western Massachusetts, as my colleagues well, I'm sure will tell you, we've always gotten the short end of the stick in terms of getting insufficient funding. And the, uh, the impact on that has often been that the, uh, the people who require inpatient or treatment services for either mental health uh, challenges or substance abuse oftentimes get shipped out to the eastern part of the state where the resources are, are, right. are more plentiful, which obviously creates a pro, uh, an impact on, on, on your recovery because your, uh, your family and your support systems have to be part of the recovery process. My colleagues here, will, 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 I'm sure, will, will agree that we've been having meetings over the past number of years with, ho with local hospitals who uh, unfortunately don't get the fa their fair share of reimbursement from the state for the services provided. We creates, you know, creates a problem in, in, t in terms of their, of their vi viability. For that, for that, so that's, an that's an issue that, uh, again, hopefully we'll be, ad we'll, we'll, we'll be addressing and, uh, and, again, create more access to, to services. And Representative Bega, you've been pushing for an increase in per-student allocation for Hoyo Community College. Can you explain the discrepancy between that per student allocation in Western Mass as opposed to uh, community colleges in the eastern part of the state? I can't explain how it happened because uh, <laughs> it's before my time. Um, and I think before there was a formula, you know, each college would just be, you know, often just advocating and trying to get their earmarks, as it were, and trying to get their own specific funding. Um, so now when the formula in place, when we put in additional funding for community colleges, which we all support, um, Hoyok still continues to be last because their allocation is just the lowest. And so and we're just trying to figure that out and say, well, you know, here we are, a community college that keeps its rates low because uh, we understand our community that, and their need for access to it and it has to be affordable, but yet we're not getting the support. And that's across the board. I mean, even the colleges that are getting more per student allocation aren't still meeting that 50-50 you know, challenge and promise, if you will, that we're trying to have with the state. You know, we did it one one year, I think it was, what, four years ago, I think, my first term maybe, that we, you know, we met that 50-50 challenge where the state would pay 50% of tuition for all of our community colleges and state universities. So HCC is doing amazing work. Uh, and when you think about whether it's in our public schools, whether it's in mental health, whether it's in our community colleges, it's those additional services that we're doing. You know, it's putting out the food pantries. It's, cr it's creating those additional wraparound services for our students that aren't necessarily reimbursed but have to happen. Okay. And Representative Finn, just wanted to get your thoughts um, on the climate control issue. That is uh, Speaker DeLeo's call for a uh, $1 billion 10-year plan mm -hmm. uh, to address climate change. Uh, what is it, Greenworks, I think he's, yeah. he's called it. Um, your thoughts on that ambitious plan. Uh, is that feasible, practical at this point? Uh, it's a huge expense. But it's an important issue, obviously. It certainly is, and I, I do think that it's viable. And I think one of the, thing, the one of the reasons why you'll see uh, that idea get a lot of support is because, uh, as I understand it, uh, you know, communities will be able to apply for competitive type grants, and so each community will be able to, you know, say, "Hey, this is what's important to us," or "This is what we've we've identified as a significant." Um, climate impact or climate change problem that we're going to face and this is one way because me when you talk about many of these uh, climate change problems that communities are going to face they come with significant price tags and so in many insta instances if not all communities are going to have to be reliant on getting uh, funding from you know some other source because they're not going to be able to afford you know, to pay for those mitigation uh, efforts. And so it's gonna be a real, real big problem. Success, I should say.